Hi, Keith here. In this video I'm going to look at a type of design called a repeated measures design. This is a type of study in which subjects are monitored or observed multiple times. In this case, three times before, during and after some particular activity. What I've simulated here is an exercise activity and looking at the effect on heart rate. So we have heart rate or pulse measured before, during and after and we have a control and an experimental group. The controls do not take part in the exercise, the experimental group do. Because subjects vary in their heart rate, looking at individuals through time can give us more information. So let me be more specific there. If we look at individual one or subject one, they have a low starting heart rate and that pattern continues throughout the study. Um, including noting that this control group does no exercise. Conversely, subject three has a high heart rate and that persists through the study. You can look for subjects four, five and six and subject two and you'll see the similar sort of thing except for the experimental group as you would expect it during the activity the heartbeat increases and I should point out that um, I made these data up. So if we analyse this just as a two factor design where one factor is group and the other factor is time, we're leaving out the fact that we have taken repeated measurements on the same subjects. And the problem that repeated measurements brings in is what I just mentioned. The observations for individuals tend to be correlated. So people with low pulse rates tend to have low pulse rates throughout and people with high pulse rates tend to have high pulse rates without or throughout the study. So we've got to somehow, somehow take that into account. If we don't, we've got a pattern of correlations within the observations and depending on how that pattern develops, we can have a inflated type 1 error rate, that means we make too many type 1 errors, or far too few. And, and the reason will be we haven't taken into account part of the design of the study. Now, to actually analyse this in a statistical package, we've usually got to put it in this kind of format. So this is the stack format, where I've got a variable for subgroup, time and subject, and then the last variable is the dependent variable pulse. This makes it clear that it is a three factor design and here each subject is operating as in a sense their own control. And we can remove from the data that part of the variability that is due to differences among subjects. We'll see how that works. Now, there are some assumptions made in doing this analysis and depending on the situation and the data, these assumptions may be more or less realistic. So I urge you to go and look at some of the assumptions made in repeated measures analysis experience with respect to the variance-covariance ratio. Okay, so let's run the analysis. So we're at Hanover and we're going to have to do a general linear model because this is a, a complicated or more complicated design. And up here we'll have pulse and the model is here. I've got a group term. I've got a term for subject and I've got a term for time. The term for subject has group in brackets because subject is nested within groups. As you saw, three subjects do one treatment, three subjects from the control group, 
three different subjects are in the experimental group. There are repeated measures designs which involve the same the subjects being in the experimental and control group and the setup would be slightly different. For instance, we could um, have them in the control group one week and in the experimental group the next week if the procedure itself doesn't really affect the thing being measured. I have a group by time interaction. So group, time, subject, nested within group. Group by time interaction. And also time by subject interaction because I've looked at each subject on each of the three sampling times or at least under each of the three circumstances. And then subject is a random factor. It's random because there, presumably, we're not picking particular subjects. We're just asking for volunteers and then randomly assigning them to be either in the control group or in the experimental group. If we ran this thing a month later, we probably would have a different group of subjects. Um, I don't have any covariate options. Use the standard type 3 sums of squares. I'm not doing comparisons or graphs. Results. Um, on the results, I have put the analysis of variance table and expected mean squares and variance components. I'll come to that. OK. So here's the analysis. Now one thing to note for, to start with is we've got asterisk denominator of F test is zero or undefined. Because we're making repeated measurements on each subject, we only have one subject or one observation I should say. Let's go back to the table. We only have one observation on this subject in the control group before. One during and one after. And that's typically going to be the case with this kind of design. That means there's no way to estimate variation at the lowest level. There's no way to estimate variation among the subjects. Uh, that variance is undefined. There's no replicates. That's the simplest way to put it. OK. Now, I created this situation, so the actual results are not of great importance. Um, and the way I've set it up, there's actually um, no overall group effect. There is a time effect, there's a subject effect, and there's a time by group effect. So, and as I say, the results are not important, but this is what I set up. So this control group, they're just showing a trend through time and given the variability that trend is not going to be significant. But you can see how the subjects consistently differ in their pulse rate with green here being high and blue being low. Over here we can see pulse rate increases during the activity period and then drops to a lower level afterwards which is a fairly typical sort of pattern. And that's why we're getting the time uh, sorry, the group by time interaction. No change effectively here, big change here. Now, if there's no error term, how are we getting F test? All right, to do, answer that, we need to look at the expected mean squares and talk a little bit more about variance, analysis of variance. So, here are the expected mean squares. And the brackets over here match up over here. So the error term is expected to have error variation and nothing else. So that's not a surprise. Effectively, as we have no replicates, we can't estimate that term. It is effectively zero all the way through. Going up to the next term, time by subject, it is just time by subject. Going up again, group by subject is group error, which is zero, time by subject, plus the effect of groups. Now we can test for the effect of groups by dividing mean square 4 by mean square 5. If there is no group by time interactive effect, 
Q4 here will be 0 and we'll be dividing group by time uh, uh, we'll be dividing an esti one estimate of time by subject by another and that's the rationale for doing all of the tests time is also tested over group by time but group is tested over subject by group you can see it has error which is zero it has time by subject it has three times group um, and three times subject within group and then group and it can be tested over that term there because then we are testing just whether that group of x is equal to zero or not down here it's just showing us what the error mean squares are that are being used for the different tests and what the degrees of freedom are now an important specification in doing this analysis is to, spec is to specify that subject is random and random is random subjects is what sets up this kind of expected mean square structure and allows us to contrast tests up here if I run this uh, yes I'm, I'm getting that because I'm on the wrong table there we are if I have no random subjects that's what happens there's no F test I need to specify that subject is random in order for the two subject terms to be used as to be used in constructing the F ratio for the other tests okay we can do the same thing in primer so here's the same data in primer and it's an unusual data set sheet for primer because there's only one variable but what I want to do here is do a per manover in primer per manover so step one is to create the distance matrix using Euclidean distance so on, on the data sheet here it's analyze resemblance Euclidean I've already done it and then I need to create per manager design which for this one is going to look like this group fixed factor time a fixed factor subject a random factor nested in group and as soon as I set subject to be nested in group primer per manager turns this option to random because a nested factor is nearly always random okay so then up here I can run the per manager and I can just leave all the options to their defaults here oh actually I've turned short names off and I'll get this warning message no replication at the lowest level so the primer per manager is just saying hey there's no replicates here just be aware of that and then it runs the primer per manager and interestingly it says excluded terms time by subject nested in group which is used was used as an error term in the mini tab analysis you can see what's happened here and it becomes obvious if I compare the sums of squares here to the sums of squares out of the mini tab analysis prime up manager is smart enough to drop the error term entirely and to label the time by subject by group term as the residual the other tests the other F ratios here and mean squares are all identical to the primer uh, mini tab analysis I'm getting myself a bit lost and the mean squares down here I should say the mean squares down here look different but we get the same F values up here so that indicates that it's the expression down here in other words the way in which they're written that is different it's not actually what they are if they were different to the ones in Minitab 
we would end up with different F values or pseudo Fs as they're referred to here. Um, the advantage of doing the per man over is, as I've said in other videos, that the P values are generated by permutation. So the assumptions required for the analysis to be valid are less strict. Uh, and that might be an advantage with respect to the variance covariance matrix I mentioned earlier. In any case, we get exactly the same results, which is what happens pretty much all of the time that I use primer permanova and mini tap. I will add in finishing that sometimes it does depend on whether this box is ticked or not. This is generally the case for some three-factor designs and more complicated four-factor designs in particular. 